So well, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'm so grateful to Massachusetts Peace Action and Peace Action National for the extremely fine work you've done educating people uh, about so many wars. And it's a privilege surely to be on this particular panel. And as I see people entering from the waiting room to realize how many of you listening to this call have worked so hard throughout your adult lives to put an end to these forever wars. So please hear a deep gratitude from me. I'm going to start with a word that maybe sometimes we lose sight of in, in our modern world. Um, Mohandas Gandhi talked about truth force, uh, satyagraha. And I think that uh, truth telling with regard to the forever wars is extremely important, extremely needed. And um, maybe one of the things that I could offer would be some, some memories, they're anecdotal, but it happened that I was in Iraq during the 1991 war and during the 2003 war and um, 27 different times over the period of the maintenance of the economic sanctions, always traveling there um, on purpose to, bre to break the sanctions. So I'd, I'd like to draw from some of those remembrances, uh, thinking about the, the war in Iraq and then moving to the war in Yemen, which I have never visited and I don't think it's very likely that any of us will because of the blockade there. So in 1990, perhaps one of the greatest falsehoods that came forth was spoken by George H.W. Bush. He said that the United States would never stand by and allow a larger country to swallow up a smaller country. Now, isn't it important to remind ourselves that um, the United States had very just, it had recently invaded Grenada and invaded Panama. But in October of 1990, when George Bush spoke those words, uh, declaring we would never allow one country to swallow up, to devour another, at three separate ports in Saudi Arabia, there was a massive collection growing of hundreds of ships and thousands of aircraft and millions of tons of ammunition and fuel that would enable the United States to do just that, to begin devouring, destroying Iraq. It isn't the case that there were um, people who were greatly fearful of Iraq or even very aware of Iraq in 1990. That war was marketed and it was marketed to the US public consistently and adamantly. The Bush administration, Bush senior, assured people that there was no choice, there was no alternative. But in fact, a very complicit media, almost chomping at the bit for the chance to be war correspondents for the war coverage extravaganza that was going to come up, suppressed awareness of diplomatic alternatives that had been filed, that could have been explored, and that, that weren't um, unrealistic. So uh, it happened that in 1991, I was part of a team. We had wanted to interpose ourselves between the warring parties. It was a very idealistic effort, I'm sure. And uh, eventually, we were taken from a desert encampment by the Iraqi authorities into Baghdad while the bombing of Baghdad was still going on. And um, I remember, I recall distinctly being in, in a basement of the place where we were living, which was a pretty secure bomb shelter, but nevertheless seeing the stark fear on the faces, particularly of women holding their children uh, when they would hear a huge explosion and they were so worried for their children. And you know, at that time, uh, with electricity cut off all across the country, we couldn't know that in fact, a major war crime had been committed. And so may I remind you of the February 13th, 1991, bombing of the Amaria shelter using one of these hideous bunker buster type laser guided missiles. It sealed off the exits to that shelter where at least 400 people, most of them women and children, 
were sleeping and many of them were melted to death. 400 people killed, 200 people badly maimed and wounded. I mentioned that the Iraqi authorities had more or less evacuated us out of Iraq. And it was a kindly evacuation as things go. Um, some of our folks didn't want to, of their own conscience, board buses because they believed in principle they should remain in this camp. And the Iraqis uh, gently <laughs> picked people up and placed them on the bus in a very tense situation where they could have been understood if they acted more gruffly. But let's talk about another evacuation. Pouring out of Kuwait in 1991, when it was very clear that the only option was to more or less surrender themselves, young conscripts, many of them teenagers, disheveled, hungry, unarmed, were boxed in by the US military. Just imagine a major traffic jam. There was nowhere they could go. Some managed to run away and get into the desert or into surrounding towns, but many were stuck. And one US pilot said of the US attack on those trapped surrendering forces, it was like shooting fish in a barrel. And another pilot said, it was like a turkey shoot. I myself had gone along a road when we were being evacuated to Baghdad and we could see uh, vehicles that were charred and overturned and directly hit by missiles. And this was the only humanitarian road out for refugees or people seeking to flee. And it was the only way in for any kind of humanitarian supplies, which were increasingly desperately needed. And I remember we found an old abandoned typewriter in the place where we were staying. Journalists had been there. And in fact, it didn't even have a typewriter ribbon. But one thing I learned in prison the year before was if you put a piece of carbon paper in front of regular paper and bang real hard with an old style typewriter, you could make an imprint. So we were trying to type up a, something like a press release and an Iraqi cabinet level official, Mr. Adnan Dawood al Samah came up to me and I'm typing by candlelight because there's no electricity, right? And he said, excuse me, Madame, but could you type something for us? Now imagine I'm an expat from the country that's pounding the daylights out of Iraq. And he asks us to type something for them on this abandoned typewriter with no ribbon. Upon reading the document, our group said, yes, we'll type that. Because it was a letter begging uh, Javier Perez de Cuellar, then the Secretary General of the United Nations, please stop bombing this road. It's the only way out for refugees. Fast forward to 2003 and another great falsehood happens when um, George Bush Jr., George W. Bush said, our nation uh, reluctantly enters the conflict. Our purpose is sure. The people of the United States and our friends and allies will not live at the mercy of an outlaw regime that threatens the peace with weapons of mass destruction. We will not live at the mercy of an outlaw regime. This was stated after 13 years of economic sanctions of economic warfare had punished to death hundreds of thousands of children. I remember being at the bedside of one child who could not possibly survive the child, had the child had oral rehydration salts, not expensive, or some way to stave off the infection like an antibiotic that the child had contracted, the child could have survived. But none of that was allowed in to help Iraqi doctors save the hundreds and thousands of children who died as a direct result of economic sanctions that the United States states insisted on. All the while, a compliant media imagining for the US that only one person really lived in Iraq, Saddam Hussein, and he must be punished and he must be crippled and he must be stopped. And so those sanctions lasted for 13 years until George Bush, Bush Sr. took us into the shock and awe bombing. And I was there in Baghdad during that bombing and it was shocking and it was awful. But at this point, I want to at least just make one quick departure to mention that 
At the same time that the United States was insisting that Iraq was a huge danger because Iraq possessed weapons of mass destruction. And later George Bush laughed about that lie at a press correspondence dinner, laughed about it. At the same time, the United States never stopped bolstering the neighboring country of Israel's capacity to produce weapons and to buy our weapons, Israel with at least 45 thermonuclear weapons. And the United States has always protected Israel from any kind of investigation. And may I also say, friends, that I was in Gaza during one of Israel's very bludgeoning bombardments of Gaza. And I was living kind of close to where the tunnels were. And the idea was, well, we have to bomb Gaza, Israel said, because they might bring in weaponry. Well, can you imagine what kind of a tunnel Imagine the size and the dimension of the tunnel that would accommodate the United States weaponry that has gone to Israel, the D-9 bulldozers, the F-15 aircraft, the Apache helicopters, the harpoon weapon systems. I could go on it. The weapon train going into Israel from the United States would have to go through a tunnel almost the size of the Grand Canyon, it seems to me. And so when George Bush Jr., said that we will not be at the mercy of an outlaw state. I think we need to say, look, we are now at the mercy of the military contractors. We're at the mercy of people who insist that their profits, that their ability to manufacture and sell and use weapons is far more important than human life. I'm talking about Raytheon and Boeing and General Dynamics and Lockheed Martin. Let us no longer be at the mercy of those groups that can hire extremely expensive public relations companies and try to continue marketing wars. A friend of mine is in prison for his action at Plowshares Action at the Kings Bay Plowshares Weapons Site. And Carmen Trotta said, it used to be that people made weapons to fight wars, but now it seems that we make wars to sell weapons. And this is something for which we all must atone. I've been invited to also speak about Yemen. And a friend of mine, Milrai, once said, one of the ways to stop a next war is to tell the truth about this war. Well, of course, my friends, it's so hard to do that because there are so many wars, as Danny has mentioned. Uh, which war are we going to focus on? And yet again, I want to recall the deaths, the death by tortuous starvation of hundreds of thousands of Iraqi children. And now it's happening again. And this time, David Beasley of the World Food Program has very bluntly said, this is hell. He had just gone through tours of various hospitals and clinics in Yemen and saw the children who are too hungry even to cry, all of their energy has to be focused on trying to stay alive. 400,000 children, close to death by starvation. Bernie Sanders was very blunt. He said, with 400,000 children near death, lift the blockade. The United States has the leverage and has the capacity to pressure Saudi Arabia to lift this horrible, blockade, which in combination with the bombing has led to the deaths of so many people all across it. I'm sorry, all across Yemen. Let's keep in mind that Yemen is not necessarily a poor country. It's, it's in fact a resource rich country. And I believe that that's the reason why Saudi Arabia has been waging this war now moving into its seventh year. Saudi Arabia, I believe, prolongs this war because it wants to have control and to bludgeon Yemeni people into submission. And then Saudis could have control over fisheries, over uh, oil rich reserves that are in the western, eastern part of the country and the western part of the country and that very strategic port, um, the Bab al The um, reports that have come about the Houthi uh, war show that in fact, blockade or no blockade, they have managed 
to gain control over much of the north of Yemen. And to say that we want to stop U.S. support for the Saudi-led coalition does not mean that we therefore want to support the Houthis. Certainly, they have engaged in blockades themselves, blocking food and oil. They've engaged in human rights abuses and violations. But there is nothing that the Houthis possess which even begins to touch what the United States has supplied Saudi Arabia with in terms of weaponry and formerly of fuel and intelligence and cover at the United Nations. And uh, certainly with regard to the urgency of lifting the blockade, um, if, if the blockade isn't preventing the Houthis from getting weaponry, then is the purpose of the blockade to punish innocent civilians? Um, I think that my time has uh, been used now, and I'm sorry if I've gone over time, but I do again want to thank everybody who has come to this panel and urge you, please, be in touch with your elected representatives, uh, telling them that it's crucial that the blockade be lifted, that uh, in increased aid be given to people in Yemen who are now facing so much desperation, and that the United States stop all sales of weapons to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia-led coalition. Uh, keep in mind that uh, ships are departing from the port of Baltimore carrying uh, different kinds of very sophisticated weaponry uh, on a monthly basis. Keep in mind that uh, the Marinette shipyard in uh, northern Wisconsin is manufacturing littoral combat ships for sale to Saudi Arabia. And from Chicago, I'm sorry to report the Boeing company is selling 650 laser guided missiles to Saudi Arabia. This is wrongful and we can work